Welcome to another in the series of Perth U.S. Asia Center Foreign Policy Conversations. As those of you who have followed the center for the last six years know, we have a particular focus on our near neighbors in what we call the Indo-Pacific. Uh, those countries that are close to us, Indonesia, uh, Thailand, uh, India. Uh, but in recent years, we've had a particular focus and, and uh, passion for the country of Vietnam not quite as close to Perth as, as Jakarta might be, uh, but a dynamic country which has begun to impact uh, not just ASEAN and Southeast Asia, the region in which Vietnam sits, but which has really impacted global views of the region in which we find ourselves. Um, Vietnam is the last country that a member of our team, Kyle Springer, our, one of our research associates, visited uh, right before the COVID-19 crackdown, and we've had several reports on it this year. So it's with particular delight that today's conversation is with Kat Tao Nguyen, a, a close friend and supporter of the center. Kat is co-founder and chair of the Australia-Vietnam Young Leadership Dialogue. Uh, she is a managing director of Global Ready LLC and a Lumina Learning partner, assisting clients with inclusive leadership, diversity, and belonging strategy. She's worked long in corporate law, private equity, international education. She was formerly chair of the board of Loreto Vietnam, formerly the managing head of EY Law Vietnam, a director of the Australian Chamber of Commerce in Vietnam, on the national advisory board to the uh, SBS here in Australia. Her memoir, uh, We Are Here, was published by Alan and Irwin and was shortlisted for the 2016 New South Wales Premier's Literary Awards. Uh, and she's now in Ho Chi Minh City, been living back in Vietnam since 2007. On a somewhat parochial basis, we at the Perth US Asia Center remember her fondly for both being the inspiration for and one of the key delegates to our inaugural WA ASEAN Trade and Investment Dialogue just two years ago and a kind supporter of us ever since then. So Kat, thank you for taking the time and joining us today. I appreciate it. It's really uh, fantastic to be with you, Gordon. Um, and uh, I have really, really uh, fond memories of that um, experience uh, with your organization and also going to Perth for, I think it was like a 15 year hiatus, I think, um, before I went back to WA, but it was um, so phenomenal. Um, and I think there is just a lot of potential between um, WA and, and Vietnam and ASEAN. Well, we had intended to bring you back this year. Uh, we are going to continue our annual WA ASEAN Trade and Investment Dialogue, but it's going to have to be virtual in the, in the COVID-19 era. But we will look forward to a moment when, when the borders are dropped and we can resume kind of direct contacts and make sure that it's not another 15 years before we get you back to the <laughs> WA. Indeed. Before we, we launch into more weighty matters, I want to, to start out with a more controversial question. I, I noted it in several other previous bios with you that you're passionate about fish sauce. And so I'm going to just jump right in with the hard question. <laughs> if you're an average Aussie and all you know is, and again, apologies to the Thai, the kind of cheap squid brand fish sauce that you can find on the shelves of Woolies or, or, or Coles, you know, what is the next step up if you want to upgrade? Should we be going to Viet Huang Three Crab or, you know, what should we be looking for if we want to, yeah. to join you and the, among the connoisseurs of the fine levels of fish sauce? Well, you know, fish sauce is, uh, if you did read um, uh, somewhere that I, I really love fish sauce and Shiraz. So Australian Shiraz and Vietnamese fish sauce. So that's, well, maybe together at the same time could be a very interesting combination. But, um, you know, it's a bit difficult for Australians because the fish sauce that I uh, use is in Vietnam and it's not exported to Australia yeah. yet. So, you know, it's a hundred year old company and um, they've been making it a traditional way. So I won't tease you with, um, with the brand, but I, I think, if you're in Australia, uh, Viet Hung is the next be best thing. It's mass, but it's very good, you know. Wow. So there you go. There's my tip for the day. Well, you entice us to come to Vietnam to try the, the good stuff as we will. Yes. Well, look, yes. Vietnam is really an interesting case. Um, other countries, Japan, Korea, Singapore, especially Taiwan, have gotten a lot of attention for their COVID-19 responses. Uh, a country that hasn't got nearly as much attention and yet has had a tremendous response has been Vietnam. Up until mm. last month, you know, they, it had gone through the entire pandemic without having a single fatality. Unfortunately, there's been a, a relatively small outbreak recently, but Vietnam has been quite confident not only in its management of the COVID-19 pandemic, 
but uh, the uh, economic impacts as well. I was wondering if you might just start off by giving us kind of big picture. You're sitting there in Ho Chi Minh City, you're involved in the business community, obviously like it is in every other country around the world, the social health and economic impacts of the COVID-19 virus are gotta be front and center uh, on your mind and that of your colleagues as well. Would you help our audience understand how Vietnam has handled it uh, and what the broader implications are for Vietnam's economy, uh, its, its, its trade, uh, its engagement with the region? Well, um, I am a little bit disappointed that um, globally Vietnam didn't get as much coverage as it should have. Um, you know, for a country that borders China with 96 million people, and even up until the second outbreak, which happened, you know, within the last month or so, um, Vietnam has less than a thousand infections, mm. right? So, I mean, I think that is quite phenomenal. And, you know, the deaths are less than less than 25, you know. So, but um, before, in the first wave, no deaths, only a few hundred cases. Now, I think, you know, as the World Bank described Vietnam's um, response, it acted rapidly and boldly. So very quickly on, um, it shut down its borders, it closed all the schools, um, and the lockdown as a subsequence was only 22 days, okay? So even in this second wave, we haven't had um, a national lockdown like the first, first time. So the, the implicate and the way that the Vietnamese government handled it, I think, um, was quite uh, coordinated. Um, it does have a lot of infrastructure um, in order to um, support the contract tracing, but it has adopted technology very, very quickly. So, you know, at the moment it's got um, a Blue Zone app. So the app is called Blue Zone and almost all the citizens have downloaded it. And the app will basically notify you if you are close um, and level one, two or three or four um, to a, a place where someone has been infected. So then you, you, you basically self isolate. So um, I think it was very rigorous in terms of the approach. And also this, the sentiment of, of the Vietnamese people is very collectivist. Um, and so people you know, would feel shame if they would, would cause burden to the community in, in preference for their own rights. So I think that's, that's something that's also a distinguishing difference um, with some of the other uh, countries. Um, but because the, the, the Vietnamese adopted technology, um, they responded not with complacence. Um, they were very, uh, you know, proactive. I think it has had um, still negative effects for the economy, but it has been sheltered um, to some extent. Um, because Vietnam opened up um, pretty much early on while everyone was in lockdown, it was able to still export. Okay, so compared to its competitors, for example, if you look at um, the shrimp and aquaculture um, industries, you know, its competitors are Ecuador, you know, other countries that were in complete lockdown. So Vietnam was able to actually gain. So um, even though the growth for Vietnam has been the lowest in 30 years, it's still, you know, registered about 3.8% growth um, in the first few months of the year. Yeah, um, and also, you know, while its borders were locked down, um, the Vietnamese government has allowed, um, you know, foreign experts to come in, so engineers, you know, and the like, in order to ensure that foreign invested uh, manufacturing operations and other essential operations for export will be um, uninterrupted. So uh, whilst the supply chain, um, raw materials and so forth, uh, you know, around the world has disrupted Vietnam's um, exports, it, it's still um, it's still been able to, it's, it's complete negative effects have been mitigated to some extent. The other driver also is that Vietnam's rising middle class and middle class is very robust. Um, it's the fastest growing middle class in Southeast Asia. Um, and because domestic consumption accounts for about 60% to 62% of the entire GDP, while we were in lockdown and, and our borders have sort of relatively been closed, it's domestic consumption that's been driving um, the economy. And out of the, you know, 60% um, of GDP that is domestic consumption, 42% is essential goods. So 42% is spent on essential goods and services. So the discretionary spend is only about 20 something percent. So, you know, that has also helped um, Vietnam to sort of be, uh, uh, you know, not as devastated. Um, certainly, 
Uh, there are certain industry sectors such as tourism, uh, which is really uh, devastated in hospitality. But I think overall, um, it's it's riding this uh, pandemic pandemic quite well. You know, even before COVID nineteen, uh, I think for those Australians who understood the need for the country to diversify its trading relationships and its markets mm -hmm. and, and the potential source of investment. Vietnam was a remarkable you know, country of focus. Uh, the fact that they, they've got a population almost four times that of ours, uh, the fact that there, there are these longstanding ties uh, has, has meant that inevitably we need to be looking at, uh, as you pointed out, uh, the country in Southeast Asia with the, the largest and, and most, the fa rather the fastest growing middle class. And so um, I wonder if I might take a step back and look a little bit more specifically at the Australia-Vietnam relationship. Through your work with the Australia-Vietnam Young Leadership Dialogue, you've been mm -hmm. thinking, I think, probably bigger picture about that relationship itself. Uh, but it's a, it's a really interesting one. Uh, Australia as a country is, uh, and defines itself as a nation of immigrants. Um, and and uh, much of its success historically and certainly today uh, has been built on the efforts and the innovations and the relationships that immigrants have brought to our shores here. But Vietnam has a unique place even in the history uh, of migrants. Um, I think you may recall from our previous conversation, my, my wife is from Laos, you know, the next door neighbor uh, to, to, to Vietnam. She similarly, uh, due to the disruption of the Vietnam War era, eventually went to the United States uh, as a refugee where I met her there before our own migration here to Australia. But what we encountered here when we arrived seven years ago is a country which had in fundamental ways been transformed by Vietnamese migration in a way that it wasn't by British or European migration because in some ways it was the Vietnamese migration that faced the country, forced the country rather to come to, to, to face with its, its racist history, with the white Australia policy, uh, and that led to the more successful subsequent waves, waves that we're seeing today from China, from other countries in Southeast Asia. So I'm wondering if you might, um, again, I realize you've written books on this and it's hard to ask you to, to summarize this in a short question, but give us kind of your broad assessment of the Australia-Vietnam Vietnam relationship, the people-to-people -people ties in particular, uh, and then where you think the real potential is for that relationship in particular to go forward? Thanks for the question, um, Gordon, and also the, the, the context as well. Um, you're right, you know, the, the early Vietnamese uh, community diaspora in Australia, I think the critical mass was really because of the refugees that, that came after the war. And you're right, it, it did force Australia to reckon within itself. And you look at some of the, uh, the debates in parliament around that time, um, you know, in terms of um, what they were viewing as our obligations in Australia and these people and the war that we were involved with. Um, and, you know, we were the boat people, you know, we arrived in droves, um, although my family actually went by foot across the killing fields of Cambodia. So mm. we, we crossed um, two borders um, through Cambodia, Vietnam, through the jungles, through the mass graves and through the most mined area, land mass in the history of the world. So that was a, a border between Thailand and Cambodia and we only lost one person. Um, and uh, we managed to arrive um, in a refugee camp uh, in Thailand. And then we, we got to Australia. So our route actually meant that for those who went in that way, um, there was only a 10% survival rate. For those that went by boat, there was a 50% survival rate. And so, you know, when we, we think about this context and we, we, we know now, you know, we, everywhere we go and we look at this, we take it for granted in terms of, you know, um, the, the Vietnamese presence in Australia, but there also wasn't without teething. So there was a certain time period where in Australia, there was a lot of, um, you know, organized crime and, and violence and people sort of forget that and just sort of think, okay, here's this sort of fantastic um, contribution that the Vietnamese have made. And so I think it's really symbolic of a bilateral relationship. You know, symbolic in that, you know, you have to teeth together, you have to grow together, and you have to get to a point where 
a healthy functioning relationship is not extraction. So I think, you know, immature relationships look at how do I actually get something from that other country, right? And then we move to from extraction to trade and transactions. So mm -hmm. it's what do I have to sell to you and what do you have to sell to me? But I think a more mature um, and nuanced um, and successful relationship is co-creation and collaboration. And this is where we can see, okay, how do we actually create together solutions for the shared problems that we actually have within our particular region and also subsequently for the world? So I think Vietnam and Australia has excellent foundations. It really does. Um, we were one of the first countries to actually normalize our relations uh, with Vietnam after, actually before the, the end of the war. So um, this was in 1973. So the war ended in 1975. Um, and during the US trade embargo, Australia actually approved aid support for Vietnam, which it desperately needed. You know, people were starving during that time. And in 1993, ANZ was one of the first banks to actually obtain a license to operate in Vietnam. And in 2012, Australia was actually the largest provider of aid uh, finance to Vietnam, and it has built um, in critical, uh, critically important bridges and infrastructure in Vietnam. And, you know, there's a bridge in, in the Mekong Delta called the Meitong Bridge. It's called the Australia Bridge by the locals. And my illiterate grandmother even knew that it was the Australia Bridge. Um, but yet, you know, in 2017, three years ago, ANZ, you know, signs were replaced by Korea's Shinhan Bank signs, you know, when Shinhan Bank uh, purchased the, the retail arm. The Commonwealth Bank also uh, closed its branch in Vietnam. It used to actually have an innovation hub in Vietnam servicing the rest of the world, including South Africa, creating products for Indonesia. Now that's also closed as well. So, you know, when you look at two-way trade in Vietnam, it is still actually relatively low, you know, like compared to New Zealand with a country of 5 million, we have more trade, you know, with New Zealand than, than with Vietnam. And so I think, you know, there is a lot of capacity. Um, and I think that we, di diplomatically, I think we are at um, an incredible stage. You know, Vietnam signed a strategic partnership with Australia, the highest level of diplomatic relationship between two nations. Um, but I think, the, the, uh, to be really honest, the Japanese and the Koreans have holistically engaged with Vietnam very well. So they have very early on moved on the continuum of the relationship beyond extraction and trade. They have moved with soft power engagement very, very well um, and education and, and culture and trade and investment and loans and a whole bunch of things, but it was really strategic and holistic and coordinated. So what is the result of that? The result of that is Vietnamese are studying in Japan more so, more and more than Australia. When you look at um, online learning platforms, we you look at short courses like Coursera, for example, the top searches are Japanese language and Korean language, right? So, you know, the, the benefits are so much more multifaceted. And I think there is a lot more opportunity um, for Australia to engage with Vietnam. On that particular note, I'd like to sort of speak a little bit about the people to people links through the Australia Vietnam Young Leadership Dialogue. So this is a platform where we are uh, getting together exceptional young leaders between 25 and 35 to come together on a transformative journey. And this looks at leadership, it looks at courage, it looks at um, sustainability, um, what does it mean to be a leader in our region. Um, and it really is about that third wave of a healthy relationship, about co-creation. And we are so, so proud that Sir Peter Cosgrove, um, the esteemed Sir Peter Cosgrove, is our patron. So um, he recognises that the future of the bilateral relationship is with these types of um, incredible visionary young people. And Peter had a relatively recent visit to Vietnam, didn't he? Wasn't he there just last year? Yes, um, when he was still Governor General, he uh, came to Vietnam and uh, was incredibly received uh, by the people and the government there. Um, he, as you know, you know, was was um, very significant in the peacekeeping efforts in East Timor. And at the time when he visited Vietnam, 
was um, sending its first ever peacekeeping contingent abroad to South Sudan um, to deploy a military hospital. And it was really moving. I was actually um, the project manager for the English language component, which was funded by the Australian government. Um, so it was really moving, you know, being on the tarmac at this, um, you know, airport, which was formerly a war ravaged airport, a country that was receiving um, aid from the rest of the world and now contributing to peace. Um, and so Sir so Peter Cosgrove addressed uh, the group uh, which included uh, men and women and doctors and nurses um, from the military hospital in South Vietnam and um, and was incredibly inspiring, but it was a really moving moment. Kat, I, I appreciate your framing of you know the, the co-creation phase of an economic relationship and, and obviously your own trajectory from a childhood in Western Sydney to being back in Vietnam now, training and helping, assisting others, and in many cases representing Australia in that same regard uh, is one example of that. However, I also detected a bit of um, dismay, frustration in your remarks in the failure of Australian business writ large to invest to the degree they should be. Right? And again, that would, that would track with our own experience at the Perth US Asia Centers. You know, six years of, of, of calling for the nation's business community to diversify, diversify, diversify has resulted in an economy which is less diverse before. It's hard mm -hmm. to get companies not to kind of chase the levels of gold that are in China and the expectations in China, and they're missing out on a kind of the, the, the other opportunities that are there. You, you mentioned the decision of ANZ and Commonwealth Bank, Bank to sell out. It all leads me to a, a, a conclusion, which I'll, I'll test whether you agree with it or not, and then maybe get your reaction to it. And that the next phase of co-creation is much more likely to be driven by that rising, dynamic, young, energetic community in mm. Vietnam than it is the much smaller community we have here in mm. Australia. In other words, uh, if you look at your Vietnamese counterparts that are active participating with you in the Australia-Vietnam uh, mm. young leadership dialogue, my guess is they're the ones who are, are, are looking out for partnerships, et cetera. And our challenge is just to entice them away from Korea and away from Japan. And let me note here, just as an aside, I really appreciate your bringing up Korea uh, and Japan because one of the narratives we hear so often here in, in Australia when it comes to ASEAN is it's too hard, it's too complex, there's too many cultures, there's corruption, the ease of doing business is difficult. And, and my reaction is, well, well, somehow the Koreans have figured it out, you know, the Japanese have figured it out. What is it that we can't do in that process? So anyway, let me, let me just get your reaction to that, but in particular to uh, my own sentiment that what we really need to be doing is identifying and enticing you know, leaders on that side to, to come here to engage with us there because they're the ones with a lot of the drive initiative and the numbers. Yeah, really interesting um, point, Gordon. Um, on the first one, though, when you talked about diversification and Australia now during COVID really sort of realising that we have been far too reliant, you know, on, on say, for example, you know, China, right? You know, we, you look at different... Um, uh, different sort of um, in indices that look at how integrated or how reliant are we on, on China, especially in, you know, strategic areas. You know, we're reliant on China for 595 categories of goods and 167 in critical national infrastructure, according to the Henry Jackson Society. And although Vietnam um, is heavily, China is Vietnam's largest trading partner. It accounts for 22% you know, of Vietnam's basically trade. But I think Vietnam has been very strategic in how it engages with other partners. The China, US is second, by the way. So, you know, the manifestations of the tensions, Vietnam is absolutely caught in the middle. So I think that, you know, your, your hypothesis or proposition that the Vietnamese young people or young leaders um, have a greater propensity to sort of, you know, um, be fueling the relationship, I think is accurate, Gordon. I think it's absolutely accurate. And I think it's also, it, it, it's because of a few things. One thing I have observed is that because Vietnam has been a developing economy and the young people who have needed to look outwards, 
who have needed to look outwards, have not looked outwards with a sense of complacency, right? So this is a country where their parents had experienced, you know, starvation and so forth, even though, you know, 65% of the population are under 30 or 35, and they don't remember any of that. There is sort of, you know, those legacies. So when they look outwards and engage outwards, it is with a sense of drive and hunger and, and, and you know, entrepreneurial spirit. And is it, it is to look outwards in a very broad sense. So they have looked outwards west, they've looked outwards north, east, south, right? So when you look at international students, the private fee paying, yes, have gone west, but the scholarship students have for long time, for a long time gone to Thailand, you know, gone to, to China, gone to other, uh, Japan to study on scholarship. But when you look at sort of the equivalent in Australia, when we look outwards, we look west. We have only looked west. And we look to the US, we look to the UK, we look to, you know, the countries that we have traditionally for dominant cultures aligned with, right? Now, Australia is a very multicultural nation, but I don't think it is the most successful multicultural nation in the world. And we still have dominant cultural norms that lure and seduce our businesses, seduce our young people, you know, when they decide to travel and explore. And so for groundbreaking programs like the New Colombo Plan, um, you know, that is trying to encourage young, young stud students at university to sort of spend time abroad, it still is difficult for, for us to get Viet students who are interested in Vietnam. And yet, if you look at the data, Vietnam is the potential for us to diversify. Um, it has all of the, I guess, um, you know, key tenants that will make it a dragon and make it an incredible, uh, you know, country in its own right um, in the next 10 years. Well, I think both the challenge posed by those dominant culture norms that you just addressed and the potential that is inherent in Vietnam underlines what you were introducing to us just a minute earlier, which is the, the work of the, the Australia-Vietnam uh, Young Leadership Dialogue. And I'm wondering if you might address the work of the dialogue in this mm -hmm. current time, because obviously uh, we're not able to entice you down to Perth, uh, international travel is limited. How are you keeping those people-to-people uh, -people ties alive in this era? And, and particularly, how are you continuing to inspire that rising generation to be able to challenge those dominant culture norms that you were talking about? Well, the short answer it is it's very difficult, Gordon, <laughs> as uh, as you are finding with your own organisation as well. But I think you know what's really um, important is to always go back to why you were established. So we are in a process of creating a strategy for the next um, five plus years, um, and Sir Peter Cosgrove <clears throat> has joined us in our last board meeting and and helping to uh, help shape that strategy, which we will make public um, in, the, in the near future. But when we articulated very clearly um, our vision and our mission, it is very simple. So we, our vision is to advance sustainable prosperity through a deeper Australia-Vietnam bilateral relationship. And our mission is to create ignite and nurture a network of exceptional young leaders from Australia and Vietnam to accelerate efforts towards the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So we measure our success by, by our impact through these young leaders and co collaborative efforts and co-creation against these global goals which impact all of humanity. Right, so it's so what we we do is every two years through a dialogue, a face to face. It was a face to face dialogue. We bring these exceptional young leaders together, and we orient them and we ignite within them a sense of purpose, which is beyond anything that they have thought before. We believe, and so and then we nurture, we create a platform, um, and in our ultimate um, goal to create an ecosystem whereby not just the, the delegates and the alumni, but all the stakeholders who touch our organization from sponsors to you know, um, speakers and community organizations, we create an ecosystem whereby that co-creation is possible. And the co-creation is towards the sustainable development goals. 
Um, and I have to say, you know, the people that we have come across as the delegates of the organisation um, has been absolutely phenomenal. You know, I mean, there are a few people that I'd, I'd mentioned that are um, alumni. So we have 2,000 expressions of interest, but we only choose 10 to represent each country. So the filtering um, process is, is incredibly difficult and robust, and we involve the ambassadors in selection and a whole bunch of people. Um, but, you know, from Vietnam, these people are, you know, for example, um, has 35,000 staff. You know, one CEO, he's, he's 34, 35,000 staff, has been involved um, in the first privatization of an, any airport in Vietnam. These are critical infrastructure projects, you know. Um, one person is the youngest property developer in Vietnam and a partner to JW Marriott and Four Points Sheraton. So she develops um, those, those uh, real estate projects. Um, another is, um, you know, uh, manages an impact investment fund um, that is one of three um, active funds in Vietnam in that space. And, uh, you know, we have entrepreneurs, startups, storytellers. So, so these are people with, incredible influence and incredible vision. So we are harnessing them towards a deeper bilateral relationship for the benefit of a common good. And I think going back to your earlier point, Gordon, you are absolutely right. It, it is with these young people who don't possibly have a lot of the, um, the burdens um, or, or the, 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 the norms that have limited their risk appetite. OK, and so from the Australia side, you know, we have incredible young Australians um, under 35. So they are very established in their own right um, in a whole bunch of different sectors um, from private equity to, you know, um, to conservation. And it's really good because we have filtered those who are already have a demonstrated interest in Vietnam. So I think for our for us, rather than, you know, mass um, trying to sort of get people interested in Vietnam. We already, because of our organisation, we have people who would naturally uh, come into the ecosystem. And then we just create opportunities for them to deepen that interest and therefore to accelerate the meaning of the, di the bilateral relationship. Well, listening to your inspiring description, I would just think of two quick conclusions. Number one, Obviously, I, I hope that the next dialogue can be held in person again as soon as possible because I can see the value of that. Uh, and given the caliber of participants, I can see that we in WA need to make every effort to try to entice you to hold one of your dialogues here in Perth. Uh, uh, we would love that. We would absolutely love that. Let's talk to your state government. <laughs> well, as you mentioned, uh, one of the, the focuses of the center for the last three years has been to support the state government's Asian engagement strategy. Uh, and so you were kind enough to join us uh, two years ago for the inaugural WA ASEAN Trade Investment Dialogue and your remarks were inspirational then. Uh, last year we had a larger event still uh, and we had planned for an even larger event this year. It will be different, it'll be, it'll be virtual. Uh, uh, but I, our hope really is to inspire not just the state government, but businesses from the state. Already, uh, you know, the Perth Airport is, is exploring opportunities for direct flights with Vietnam, which would make a tremendous mm. difference for, wow. for tourists, for investors, et cetera. Um, but I wonder if I might end there. Uh, if, if we're looking here in Western Australia, uh, people are, as you rightly point out, uh, far more receptive to the diversify, diversify, diversify mantra uh, or requirement than they were before. Um, mm. And they're needing to understand the potential that is in Vietnam. So it's not viewed just historically, but in terms of of where the country is going, the demographics, the middle class, the economic growth. Uh, are there a couple of, of, of sectors uh, where you think that people should be paying particular attention to in Vietnam? Are there individual success stories that would inspire the community here in WA to give greater priority to or to pay closer to attention to Vietnam uh, than they are currently? Um, I think that it's really fantastic that the demographics as such and the proximity of WA to Asia um, make it possibly more open, you know, to engagement and also the time zones is, is a really um, uh, critical factor, really. 
Um, so I think there are a couple of things, you know, um, sectors. Now, agriculture is still a very large, um, important um, base for the Vietnamese economy, even though it doesn't feature in the top 10 exports for the people. Yeah, it doesn't actually feature in top 10 exports. Um, for the people, agriculture is incredibly important. Okay. Now, there is a lot of innovation happening in Vietnam in agriculture technology. So I think for WA um, and Australia, we have very shared concerns. The shared concerns are water, you know, managing, um, you know, salination, managing water resources. Um, and climate change is a massive reality in Vietnam. We, I think, don't have the, um, the, 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 the issues or the politics around, you know, climate change. For us, um, we know in reality and also according to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change that the Mekong Delta, which is home to millions and millions of residents, is the third most impacted delta in the world by climate change. And we, is, we are seeing all of the changes happening right now and affecting so many people and industries. So the government has oriented, um, especially in agriculture, to support the development of agriculture technology. And there is one particular um, interesting example of co-creation. So the University of Technology, Sydney, um, came to Vietnam and created a joint research center. It's the first joint research center of its kind for Australia in Vietnam. And it subsequently has developed another one. So it has two. So they are doing research in agriculture. They're doing research in cyber. Um, they're doing research around pollution, around shared concerns. Um, and it is really interesting. So that was through people to people links, but also through institutional support and, 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 and um, you know, formal support. And so, you know, the products of that is then going to benefit both, um, both nations. And I think that, um, you know, I actually authored a report um, commissioned by the Department of Education and Training from Australia um, called Inspired Potential. And that report was around research and innovation partnerships between Australia and Vietnam. Um, I can provide you that link um, later on. But those detailed case studies that are very practical and that look at principles of engagement um, that can lead to sort of shared innovation. So, you know, Vietnam, um, in terms of energy resources, is making structural changes. So it has put targets for renewables, um, you know, to be a very important part of, um, of, of, of energy use in Vietnam. And actually in 2017, solar was non-existent. But by the end of 2019, Vietnam has the largest share of solar installed capacity in Southeast Asia. So it has 44%, it surpassed uh, Thailand and Malaysia. So within two years, it put the infrastructure in place, it put the feed-in tariffs, it put in the system, the loans, um, beneficial financing, and so it is moving very fast. So I hope that you know your your um, viewers will understand that Vietnam is is not uh, you know a developing lag economy. It is rapid lead moving entrepreneurial incredible ideas and really it's only about the nations or the states who are savvy enough in order to pivot um, towards vietnam that will reap um, common benefits you know wonderfully put and, and it fully comports with my own multiple trips to vietnam where the number one impression i came away with was just inspiration in, in the the youth the energy the vigor uh, with which they're approaching the world. Um, if we in Western Australia or Australia as a country approach Vietnam as a country where we can just sell something, we're missing the picture. Mm. It really is Absolutely. what we're calling the co-creative relationship. It is the dynamism that exists there. And so really what we need to be doing is enticing them to come here and work more with us. But that requires us to be inspired. And I'm confident that, that after a conversation like this, many of our viewers uh, we'll take a much closer look at Vietnam and hopefully uh, engage as quickly as possible uh, following this COVID-19 pandemic. Now, Kat, from my own lived experience, I know that uh, the, the cheap Thai brand squid uh, fish sauce is about 2 $3 in the supermarket. 
the better Vietnamese at Viet Huang, you know, three crab brand is about seven to $8 a supermarket. This conversation was a not yet available in Australia, priceless 100 year old family recipe, only available in Vietnam conversation. And I'm delighted that we have it virtually uh, to share with, uh, with our, our community. Thank you so much for your time and for joining us. Appreciate it. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, and I'm looking forward you know, to seeing as many people, you especially, Gordon, um, in, in Vietnam when the borders open um, and look forward to a further deeper engagement. Thank you. Thank you, appreciate it.